Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner and you're watching the video podcast Crushing Doubt, where we talk about my method of curing chronic pain, changing your physiology by changing your mind. With me as always is Julie Conrad, Ayurvedic health counselor and yoga instructor. You can find her at clevelandayurveda.com, on Facebook and Instagram, or you can email her at julie at crushingdoubt.org. A few housekeeping things are required for this podcast to make sense for new listeners, so bear with me as I explain a few basics. If you've heard this before, I apologize, but the new listeners need to know. So, uh, Julie, you just bear with me. First, we're going to talk <laughs> about Dr. Sarno. When I recovered from my eight years of back pain, it was Dr. Sarno's books that really broke me through to the other side. I'd really had no results of any kind seeing medical doctors. Uh, I, I I shouldn't say no results of any kind. My chiropractor was helpful to me, but only to a certain degree. When I discovered the books of Sarno, it really changed the way I was thinking about the whole thing. And we're going to talk about that in this episode, the importance of the medical doctor here in both directions, actually. So one thing I should say is we always want to say, I, I say this virtually anytime I'm meeting somebody new on this or anytime I'm doing a, a show on this. You need to know when to see a medical doctor. So for serious medical conditions, you want to rule them out with a medical doctor. Uh, just to reiterate, don't go to see a psychologist if you think you have a serious medical condition. <laughs> Not even me. Uh, so it is serious medical conditions and blunt force traumas to the body where maybe you run into a brick wall or you were playing football and you collided with somebody. Those things don't tend to come from the mind. And we're going to get into how we never really think of it as, as being in the mind. Okay, now, on this podcast, I use certain terms interchangeably, and part of that is because I, it's old habits die hard. We're talking about what I call mind-body issues, but I talk about uh, the term TMS was Sarno's original term for the back pain that, that came from the head and became real in the body. It came to be generalized to all kinds of different symptom uh, focus focuses. So information is the key to the change. And that's a big part of what we talk about on this podcast. I have a lot of new information because I've extended what I've learned, not all from, only from Sarno, but other practitioners in the field. All right, let's talk about psychosomatic. This is a term that is a big buzz item for people. Most people think it means you're making it up. That is not what is going on. This is not, these are not things that are in your head at all. They are very real in the body. But the difference in, in mind-body work is that it starts in your head and becomes very real in the body. Now, going along with that, um, I talk about how you get relief by getting rid of doubt. That's why the podcast is called Crushing Doubt, of course. But this is not an element of faith. You don't, I don't want you to believe just because you believe. I want to help you believe through science and logic. So, Julie, the thing yeah. that I wanted to talk about today is welcome. I, I did a whole ramble there with you just sitting there. Apologize for that. <laughs> but of course, I guess that's the way we start this, this show. So we are having on Dr. David Schechter. He's one of my favorite uh, people in the TMS or mind-body community and for multiple reasons. But he is... he's really whip smart about these things. He has a great book called Think Away Your Pain. And he's one of these medical doctors that provides a lot of comfort to me in the work. Because when I first read Sarno, first of all, I was skeptical. I like to say that all the time, because now I'm a really big believer in it. <laughs> I, I was very skeptical. I was like, how's a book going to cure me of back pain? Mm -hmm. But it was very important to me that it was coming from a medical doctor. If, if the first book I read was from a psychologist, I'd be like, I don't know. And this is coming from a therapist. And this is coming from a therapist who is writing a book on this stuff. So I guess I just wanted to acknowledge that it's really important to have doctors on, medical doctors who agree with us because, and I think this is true with you too, mm -hmm. the more people from more fields that agree with us about these things the better we can feel and the less doubt we can feel about things because it's a lot of people coming together. David Schechter was somebody that I discovered later, but I was very pleased when I read his book because he talks about doubt in his book. I'm not going to delve too much into it because that, that's in the interview coming up. Uh, I'm going to talk with him about it, but I wanted to acknowledge the other side of doubt with doctors, and then you and I can kind of discuss this some. Sure. Doctors can be very, doctors who agree with the mind body principle are crucial. Mm -hmm. 
doctors who can cure us of life-threatening illnesses or fix us when we, you know, run into brick walls, which makes it sound like we do that all the time. They're very important. They can help with lots and lots of things, infections, all kinds of things we need doctors for. Mm -hmm. But the one role that doctors play that isn't so helpful is in when they cause doubt, when they don't need to. I'm not blaming them for it. It's a it's a totally different field. We're, we're all catching up to speed, and I think we need to put our heads together about it. But a lot of times when people go to doctors, doctors give them a diagnosis, maybe a structural issue like herniated discs, mm-hmm. or this shocked me, arthritis is does mm-hmm. not cause pain. But in the medical community, it's very common to say these things, so common that it's it's really the common belief system. So I... I I wondered because you you work in a very related mind body field. Mm-hmm. Do you encounter this when people come to see you that either they've gotten doubt alleviated or increased by a medical doctor? Well, it's interesting you say that, Dan, because many of my yoga students, believe it or not, are physicians, um, and we have this conversation all the time. And I'm so grateful every time I'm able to talk with medical professionals about this because, you know, one of my students said to me, and I'll never forget, um, one of my yoga students had said, you know, it's interesting. I've been doing yoga for years. Um, I went to have my bone scan and they said I have arthritis up and down my spine, but I have no pain at all. Right. And the doctor's yeah. like, well, just keep doing what you're doing because whatever it is, it's working. Right. So that's usually like right. the best response we can get um, from a physician from doing things like yoga, like meditation, like things that are are these mind-body practices that um, are maybe considered non-traditional, but I believe are becoming a lot more traditional. But I do, I really, I have these conversations with physicians specifically about, you know, how, how and why we need to have these discussions with our patients. And you know what they say nine times out of 10? I totally agree, but we have to see 25 people a day, right? Right. They're in, they're yeah. out. And they're, and the thing that's beautiful to me is that, you know, these physicians are very open to it, especially the ones that I'm speaking with because they're actually doing the practice, right? And they say, I, I tell my patients, look, I had a, I had a physician who is a, a back pain doctor, believe it or not. And he said, you know what, Julie, they want, they just, they don't want to hear it from me. They want to come in and they want to get a shot and they want to go home. And so it's an interesting conversation because yes, mm. we absolutely, absolutely need to hear it from the physicians, but we also need to understand from the patient's perspective too, that, you know, we need to understand that, you know, having a physician say, look, I'll give you the shot, but there are these other things that you sh- maybe should be thinking about which could be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, one thing I want to acknowledge is I have been so pleased and, and surpri- surprised, initially surprised. I'm not surprised by this anymore, but I've been so pleased by talking to so many medical doctors who acknowledge mm-hmm. that stress is such a factor in this. Oh, absolutely. But, uh, first of all, I really empathize with the doctors in, in a lot of ways. They are being inundated, in, in, inundated. I don't know what inundated, but inundated <laughs> with paperwork, they, yeah. they're being forced to see people more quickly, mm-hmm. and it's all feeding into the same problem. And some of that problem is that we are so focused on procedures. Mm-hmm. Um, we, mostly meaning hospitals and, and the medical community, is being forced into procedures. Re- insurance reimburses for procedures. which mm-hmm. it, So insurance has started to drive the ship on a lot of this, and it's a big part of the problem. And it's a problem for doctors too. They, they, so many of them acknowledge to me, yes, it is stress, but they don't know what to do about it. And that's a big mm-hmm. part of what we're going to talk about on this podcast, uh, especially in the interviews and in, in the, the last segment, when I talk about the kinds of questions that I get, we're going to talk more about it. What were you going to say? I kept, I just kept talking. Into it. <laughs> I think it's really valid to, um, think about this perspective from, you know, how we can work with the physicians, you know, in any way possible to bring them what these practices are that you're having clients do, right? What we're sharing here, 
once they've experienced it within their own bodies, then it's a completely different thing, right? From reading a textbook in medical school to going out and teaching this or sharing it or telling a patient to maybe do this, you know? Right. Um, it, it makes me think of, you know, we've gone into medical schools as yoga teachers, you know, in, in here in Cleveland at the Cleveland um, uh, Case Western Medical School, which is a top medical school in our country. And we've offered it to them for no pay to go in and say, hey, there's, you, there, here are 800 med students in the toughest week of their exams, right? Their second year med students. And we would go in and we would put these, you know, med students on the floor in deep re relaxation, in meditation, in all of these experiences so that they could ex have a moment in high stress to physically feel and, ex and see how that affects them so that they have a, a, a something to look back and remember mm. when they're working with someone. So if we can get this information experientially you know, to them, yeah. whether, it, whether it starts as children, right, in school, teaching mindfulness, right? I mean, you've got, you know, from a very young that's age. That's a key theme, though. Uh, that's, I just, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm too excited. <laughs> no, 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 it <laughs> that's is. A key, it's a key theme because what you're saying is that, that change comes from feeling it in the body. And a lot of, I mean, look, you can change in lots of ways. But one thing I found in my practice as a therapist is change happens faster. Mm-hmm when it's understood and absolutely things are understood better when the body understands them and this is why doubt is so important mm -hmm. because if you go to a doctor and let's say they they're you know pretty well educated on this but they don't know what to do and they at least say well listen stress does cause a lot of this i can give you this shot or whatever you know medical treatment they would do at least they've put the idea in their head. And I think Absolutely. we've got to be- Plant the seed. That's what I always say. Plant the they, seed. Even right. if they plant the seed, it's not going to be new information for them later on. Right. Whereas if you get a doctor who's staunchly for structural issues, even though mm -hmm. the New England Journal of Medicine and all of their science goes against it, however they were trained or they, mm -hmm. they just haven't been able to shift. Because that's one thing that happens is it's hard for anybody to practice mm -hmm. a profession and then shift. I have changed a lot as a therapist over time based on all kinds of new information. And I don't mean in just information reading a book. I'm talking about information from the mind-body experience. I changed my entire practice because of it. Or, or experiences that I had going to a therapist and feeling like that worked, that didn't well, work. Well, you know what, Dan? I think that things are just shifting. I think, I think we're, we're beginning to move in a, in a really great direction. Cause I used to be very negative, like 15 years ago, thinking about, gosh, why don't doctors ever, you know, think about these things and share these things? Why, why wasn't I told It was a dark time. Guy? Yeah. And, and, but I'll tell you, when we used to go in and do those sessions with the med students, the first year out of like 800 people, one person had a yoga mat. And then the next year, few more people had, had mats. We'd ask how many people have done yoga before? Only women would raise their hand. Then five years into it, every single person had raised their hand and had had some sort of experience with it. So- I, I totally agree. We're, it, we're, in, we're in a kind of renaissance point and I, I, yeah. I think we're getting close to a tipping point and, but we still need to link up. We, we need the doctors and the, and the psychologists who understand these things. And there aren't that many of us actually that understand both. So this is why I'm I'm really excited to to talk about uh, these things with Dr. Schechter. Uh, Dr. David Schechter is going to come on. I'm going to talk to him about all of these things. We're going to talk about doubts because when when a doctor says it's structural, mm -hmm. doctors hold a lot of power. So much power. And there are Absolutely. ways in which they should. There are ways in which they should. We because we rely on them for so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about what's going on right now with the pandemic. We are reliant on the doctors to solve this. Mm -hmm. I am not here to undermine the, the power of doctors, but I want to work with them because if they put a doubt in people's heads, then their work is harder. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't say my work is harder because this is what I do. I know how to, I know how to deal with that. But mm -hmm. we, we, we do have to rely on science. We have to rely on logic also. I mean, the doctor says, well... We have to yeah, rely yeah. on intuition. Even if they're not telling us something, we can tell. 
when when we think there's hope or if we're yeah. told straight out no, feel that you feel know that. You, you feel it in, in intuitively the doctor you were saying who said okay you know this should be causing pain but it's not in a way they're they're giving a prompt for pain they don't mean to be but they're saying this should be causing pain and now that patient is more likely to develop pain when they didn't have it before and they need to look back on that logical moment so I'm going to talk with Dr. Schechter about this. He talked about doubt. He's the only person that I saw really talk about doubt a lot in his book on, on TMS. So I can't wait to talk to Dr. Schechter about this. Up next. I'm here with Dr. David Schechter, board certified in family and sports medicine, and he has been working at TMS work for decades. So he's got he's got some years on me in that. We won't say how many. I promised him we wouldn't. But I'm really excited to have him here for multiple reasons. David, first of all, is uh, extremely experienced in the work and has all sorts of insights that I can't wait to hear about. But the other thing is that we have some connections that are going to come out over the course of the interview. I'm going to I'm not going to jump right to all of them. But one of the things I wanted to say is, is David, you're you're the rare doctor who, like me, is comf comfortable enough to cross over into other territories so that we treat the whole person. And I have found this to be very important. A lot of people come to me. Obviously, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a psychologist. So I have to, but I do have to be comfortable talking about the physicality of things. It's much easier for me when they've seen, they have to have seen medical doctors for me to feel comfortable treating them this way. But I want to hear the story of how you came to that. You know, that we all, we all came to that in different ways, but for a medical doctor to cross over and be comfortable talking about anxiety and depression as you do. There has to be a story behind that. And even though we've gotten to talk before, I don't know that story. So tell me tell me how you came to do this work and, and welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me, Dan. You know, first of all, you have to have the inclination. And then there's a variety of experiences that build upon that. So one of the experiences was, I, I think, a high school, when I was in high school, I think my family doctor mentioned something about stress in relation to a physical symptom I was having. And that sort of planted a seed for me. When I was in college and studying the sociology of medicine as a college course, I learned about the biopsychosocial model from George Engel at Rochester, one of the pioneers in that area. And that also was powerful for me. But when I went to NYU med school and I was myself having knee pain that wouldn't go away after having seen a top orthopedist who took care of the New York Yankees and occasionally volunteered his time to see a medical student or two, and I didn't get better, I walked into Dr. John Sarno's office. He was a physical medicine rehab doctor who had lectured to us in anatomy. And I said to him, I'm having this knee pain that won't go away. And I briefly told him what had happened and asked him if he could prescribe some type of rehab or new, new, newfangled physical therapy. And he paused for a second and said to me, I don't know if you'll be open to this, but 95% of this chronic pain, this pain that persists is actually psychosomatic. And that threw me for wow. a loop by getting hit with a, a ice bucket of water in your face when you're sitting here talking. To <laughs> he said, I see, I see you might be a little bit skeptical. I said, well, I'm, I'm interested, but I'm, I'm, I wasn't expecting that answer. And he said, well, why don't you come to one of my seminars that I give to patients on Monday nights in uh, the Rusk Institute? So I went to the seminar the next week. And what he laid out in his presentation in the days before PowerPoint, there was actual slides that were shown. Um, what he laid out made perfect sense to me about personality, about unconscious mind, about the connection between the brain and the body. I went home that night with hope and I felt like a weight was lifting off of my shoulders. The weight was not knowing what was wrong with me and, and wondering if right. I could return to the activities like running and basketball that I really enjoyed. So that was the beginning. Oh, I didn't know you were a basketball guy. I, I'm a, I'm a, oh, maybe we did talk about that. That's sounding familiar. Well, I played, I, pl I played in, you know, intramurals in college, won a championship, that kind of thing. And I was playing in, at, at NYU right. with, you know, recreationally. Um, but anyway, the, the, the knee pain stopped me from doing that. It was, it was really disheartening because that was my stress reliever as a medical student. And um, so Sarno explained that in a seminar and then offered to see me as a patient, you know, which involved a, an examination and, and further discussion. I went to the rest of his teaching uh, lectures and my pain started going away and I started returning to jogging and then basketball. And I was uh, amazed by this. But when I shared this with other 
medical students and other attending physicians at NYU, they, they probably thought I was a kook because they didn't seem very interested in the whole thing. And I, I, I was very surprised at that. Um, so that, that was the beginning of my story. The following summer, I got a research grant and I uh, was able to do a follow-up study with, in Dr. Sarno's office and call up 177 of his former patients and kept hearing the same amazing stories that I personally had experienced over and over again. And I got to oh, see- Oh, you, you were part of that study? The very first study was performed by me. He mentions it in a couple of his books. We never published it. I know, in, yeah. We never published it in a journal, which is a, a, another story for another day. But, <laughs> um, but the, and I also got to spend the whole summer with him seeing every time he saw a patient, I was in the room. And when he did a seminar, I was at the seminar. So it was really a very profound educational experience that uh, affected the rest of my career and, and my life as well. I mean, taking away this pain and making me aware of my own tendencies toward internalizing uh, uh, stress and, and tension into physical symptoms. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, we, we hear this all the time that that people have these experiences and obviously it's going to change you because how do you how do you go back? I mean, that's one of the things I wondered about. You know, you go in. I don't know what your plans were in going to medical school and what you wanted to be. But once you see this, you can't unsee it. But that's not that you would want to. Yeah, that's very, go ahead. Yeah, as a professional, you definitely can't unsee it. I, I will say that there are patients who get better from this approach, are profoundly interested in it, and then just get on with their life and kind of it fades into the background. And then sometimes years later, <clears throat> will return or come to a different area of their body and it may take a while till they get back to me or you or someone in the field to be re-diagnosed and, and and redirected so that's kind of an interesting phenomenon i don't know if you run into that at all oh no i think that's it's a really good point because it, it's a different thing for a patient to see this and then maybe adjust their lives i've had patients who their whole lives change because of this yes but you're right there's, there's these patients who they'll get the symptom kind of into submission and then they just kind of move on. And, and some of them don't really, you know, I hear people say, oh, yeah, I, I cured my back pain through work with Dr. Sarno 10 years ago. I haven't looked back. And then there's other people who have to come back to it. But for those of us who are practicing in fields that relate to this, I just felt like, I mean, I've changed my whole psychology practice because of it. So, and you, you this, this happened to you in med school. So... It sounds to me like you, you kind of started basing your practice on it based on these experiences. But well, Sarno think, lectured to you before you, I'm sorry, Sarno yeah. le lectured to you before you even went to see him. He lectured to us in, ana well, he lectured to us in anatomy, just about musculoskeletal system. He wasn't lecturing about the mind-body connection. When I, I see. Him, when I went to see him, he told me, you know, if you're skeptical about this, come to a seminar that I give to my patients I've diagnosed with this condition I call TMS. And if it interests you, then I'll confirm you as a patient, confirm you with the diagnosis. So he kind of offered me the seminar prior to right. the office visit to see if I was in fact interested, to see if he'd be giving me the office visit sort of gratis. Uh, he just wanted to make sure I was interested. You know, I thought about going into rehabilitation medicine and just found it, thought there were some limitations in that field at that time. So family medicine, which was my first training, was was about really, the, I was hopefully a mind-body approach or a holistic approach or a biopsychosocial approach. And then reconnecting with Dr. Sarno some years later when I got into, excuse me, got into private practice, uh, that led to my getting referrals from him. So not only was I working with patients who I diagnosed in my office de novo, but there were people after he had published his second book, uh, Healing Back Pain in 91, uh, which was quite a long time ago, there were, he was beginning mm -hmm. to get a lot. It was, it was a, pretty much a national bestseller at certain, uh, in terms of numbers. And so he was getting a lot of calls from around the country from people who wanted this approach, but he didn't know any doctors who did it other than me. And I think there were maybe a couple of others at that point. I'm not even sure there was, there were, there were three or five. So he, the California ones, he started to refer to me. I started to get a lot of patients and then I could develop my own program that led to some of my educational materials and perspectives in this field. Are you from California originally? And then you went back? No, I grew up in New York and uh, went to a college at Princeton med school at NYU and then decided I would try a different part of the country for residency. Um, and I, 
did my residency about nine blocks from the beach, which seemed like a good idea since you work about 90 hours a week. I figured during those few <laughs> hours I was off, I could, I could head down to the beach. Well, this and is I, another thing that changes, changes your whole life and practice is if you go and live near the beach, you're not, you're not coming back. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've stayed all uh, the rest of my uh, time. So I'm always curious about those early years. I mean, it sounds like there were really just a handful of doctors. I wondered what you think about, because I've wondered about this. Why why do people have such trouble uh, accepting or listening to, I'm, I, you know, I, I should say this. I have not found people to be that resistant to these ideas now that I've figured out how to present them. But I've read a lot about Sarno, and of course, I've read all of his books, and I know, and I also watched uh, All the Rage, and you, you could see the footage of how frustrated he was that people didn't listen to him. I'm just curious what your take is on that, and how, why, why, why do people have such trouble with it? Doctors are less resistant now than they were, although there's still resistance. But to give you an example, there were 700 physicians within uh, half a mile of where Dr. Sarno's office was. And some years he would only get one or two referrals from physicians and all the rest would be from other patients or people who read his books once they came out. So that shows you how little support he really had from the NYU community uh, over m many of those years. I would say though that in general, there's less resistance now and that we've learned ways to explain this phenomenon of mind-body connection, I think in a more scientific way in a sense than Dr. Sarno started out with. He, he came from a very Freudian perspective and that's not a perspective that is easily um, internalized by a lot of internal medicine or orthopedic doctors or surgeons or that type of thing. So as we or anybody for that matter, it's it can be very challenging. I mean, Freud Freud had an uphill battle himself. So to carry on his tradition, I, I, but I do think that's one of the things that I really admire about Dr. Sarno. And I I um, I spoke to him on the phone once, but I never got to meet him in person and. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what he was like in, in person, because there's so many people who wonder about about him. He seems like he was this charming guy, um, but he also was very certain and very brave in in bringing his viewpoint. What what, what was he? <clears throat> excuse me. He was a very what, what was he? Yeah, he was a very yeah. confident uh, person and speaker, and he was also an iconoclast. He had his ideas. And that's what his ideas were. And you have to be really strong with your ideas to stand on an island while everybody else is screaming, you're wrong, you're wrong, or you're crazy, or you're kooky, or whatever. And so that's the example of being around these 700 doctors and having your own perspective. To his benefit, he was already a full professor of rehabilitation medicine when he started developing these ideas 45 years ago, because he had done work in stroke and aphasia um, at prior to his work in, in, in back pain and TMS. But you mm -hmm. had, so he was very strong. If you disagreed with him, as I sometimes did, because of course the, uh, the next generation or the, uh, the protégés or the disciples do tend to disagree a little bit with the uh, originator of an idea, he wasn't always that comfortable with that. And so that's where we would mm -hmm. have some clashes and disagreements. You can look back at the history of Freud and Jung and Horney and the other people that followed Freud that were also they all They all clashed with him. Yeah. And so the same thing happened with Dr. Sarno. But if you agreed with him, he was very charming. And he was, you know, in terms of not speaking about this subject, his wife and he and uh, I spent some time at their uh, summer house one year, a weekend, a very delightful people and intelligent and uh, uh, cultured, w w mannered people. Um, and I, I, I've stayed in touch a little bit with his daughter, who's a psychologist in New York. And I've written a couple letters to his wife since he's passed away. We stayed in touch over the years with letters and notes and occasional visits when I was in New York. Um, and he passed away about two, two and a half years ago or so. No, I remember, I remember the day because, you know, he had such a profound effect on my life that to lose him was like losing a, a great hero. Um, yeah. You know, it was like when a rock star died for me. <clears throat> this, this was a guy who just radically changed my life. And I have... I have a balanced view, I think, on, on Dr. Sarno, which is nobody's perfect. And, and he got us a huge, a huge amount of the way there. But and he really saved my life more than anybody, except for maybe the guy who told me about his book, because if that hadn't happened, I don't know where I would be. But I did find that I had to 
I had to come to certain ideas for myself to get better. I don't know if that was true for you uh, with the knee or maybe with later symptoms. I know that you came to disagree with him um, or at least challenge his viewpoint or, or maybe just expand the views. And one of the main connections that you and I have and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast early is I started researching all this, started reading everybody's books and <clears throat> an idea in, one of, in uh, Think Away Your Pain really jumped out at me as really resonating with, with an idea I had already had, um, you know, of my own accord, but it was so, it was so relieving to me to find it in the TMS world. It's the concept of doubt. Obviously this podcast is called crushing doubt. It gets its name because I find that Sarno and so many of his disciples focus pretty exclusively on emotions and anger and rage. And I'm not saying that's not a huge part of things, but I, the times where I struggled to get better usually weren't because I was me personally, that I wasn't aware of the anger or the rage, but because I was left with questions or I was left with fears or I was left with confusion or just the simple lack of certainty was getting in my way. So when I read in your book that it was a key factor, I was like, oh man, I thought it was just me, but tell me how you came to that idea, David. Well, it was observing uh, patients' responses to diagnosis and treatment. Uh, Sarno had taught me that one of the key steps in getting better was accepting the diagnosis. And I, and I learned that accepting the diagnosis would really be both intellectual and more emotional and visceral. And that right. and unlike other diseases or other conditions, it's very important to accept that you have a mind-body disorder or condition in order to get better from it. Okay. So there's a variety of ways we, we, we try to do that in terms of examining somebody, in terms of looking for certain tender points and personality characteristics, reviewing MRI scans and other imaging and on and on. But what I found was that some people, this is my initial assessment of doubt, that some people would actually get, get the whole concept they would get the diagnosis, they would understand what they had to do, and they would start making dramatic improvement. But then perhaps a few weeks later, or a month later, the same person who would maybe be emailing me and calling me saying, hey, I'm doing great, this is really amazing, would, would say, you know, I'm just kind of curious, I haven't done that well this week, are you sure I have TMS? And I began mm -hmm. to hear this, are you sure I have it, so many times that I began to realize that doubt was a crucial part of the disorder and getting better from the disorder. I actually have decided many years ago that part of having TMS is at some point or another doubting you have it. And part of getting better is working through the doubt. So this, the 12 stages of healing that I talk about in my book, Think Away Your Pain, is a chapter on the stages of healing. One of the stages is, is, is dealing with doubt because it's such mm -hmm. a profound element of, of, of healing. And if you doubt the diagnosis, it draws you back, in a sense, to the prior way that you were adapting to emotion and stress, which was the internalization and the, if you will, repression and, and the physical symptomatology that you got. Yeah. And, and the people, this, this can even happen to me occasionally where I'll start buying back into some old idea. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I have to review everything that's happened to me. This does not make sense. And that's one of the things I loved about Sarno and, and about reading you and many other people in, in the TMS world. We remember, you know, we remember the, the data from the past so that we don't get caught up in, well, maybe we're just wrong about this, but it's really interesting what you're saying, because I, I think, and this, this, uh, so I had, I had, realized that doubt was important in my own recovery. And I certainly saw that it was going to be important in other people's recovery. But I think you're saying something um, that has an addition to how I was thinking about it at the time I first read, read you, which is that it's kind of endemic to the sufferer. It, it's, it's a part of who the type of people are that get this. Is that, is that part of what you're saying? I, I find it so commonly that I decided that it was part of whatever the disorder or dysfunction that happens to certain people that develop chronic pain or chronic physical symptoms that ultimately are due to tension and stress. And again, this is not a pejorative in any way. I had this, you had this, you know, I just want people to understand that 
Um, it, it's just we're just trying to understand how to help people better, and in a, and in a sense, how to help ourselves better because we've dealt with these uh, conditions over the years. But yes, I think it's yeah. part of the part of the personality or part of the condition itself. You know, uh, one of the things that happened for me, and I wonder if this is true for a lot of people, is I. Um, I would say that I was a person who had a lot of doubt just in general. And then it got applied in the TMS area. And it, it came from growing up with some confusion of, of events and some traumatic things that made me doubt my own reality some. Um, enough that I, I would naturally be the kind of person who would question things. Actually, it's really interesting because um, so Sarno talks about goodism. And when I read that, that was the thing that convinced me more than anything that I had TMS. I was like, wow, I have never, I've never read a description of me better than that. And one of the things I realized as I'm writing my own book, which I'm close to getting finished with, you know, the longer it takes, the better it gets, actually. So I'll drag it out if I need to. But uh, as I was kind of reading into these things uh, and, and learning about it, one of the things I found is that goodism emerges in part because you are willing to look at the other side. So you are, you know, you're always looking to please people. So you need to know how they think. And that means you're going to doubt your own take in a sense, because you're not so certain. You're like, they're seeing this. And that. so I think the goodism and the doubt kind of fits together. I wonder what you think about that. I, I'm yeah, spitballing I, that, here, but that's, that makes, that makes sense to me. I mean, the other parts that the doubt could, could also relate to would be the self-criticism. So being being hard on yourself or self-critical is a yeah. key personality element uh, that, that fits into this mind-body uh, diagnosis. So that that's another part of it. And then the other thing that was identified by a psychotherapist I worked with years ago was self-esteem. Now it's not talked about really in Sarno's work, but what you're talking about in terms of doubting yourself or that type of thing relates to some type of maybe perhaps a self-esteem um, element that could be relating to the doubt. Um, so mm -hmm. those are, you know, those are different ways that doubt might tie in for different people, and why it then flares up as you're getting better is an interesting question, and may relate to why would somebody want to? Why would someone's brain or mind or unconscious or nervous system? Why would they want to experience a physical symptom rather than dealing with the emotion more head on? And maybe that's something you've thought mm -hmm. about as well, but it's that's an interesting question. But doubt draws you back toward the way you used to be dealing with the pain or the symptom rather than allowing you to move forward in the more challenging but ultimately more productive way of coping with things. I've definitely thought about that extensively. I, I have all kinds of ideas about it, but I, I'd love to get yours first if you if you have any on it, if not, I can kind of tell you, what, I'm sure you do, of course, but uh, yeah, I've thought about, thought about these things and I'm, I'm curious to see what you have to say as well. Um, so it, when people have traumatic experiences, I, either in childhood or at other times, it seems like we have this tendency to wall them off, hide them, submerge them in order to be able to function. I think, I think that there are, experiences mm -hmm. sometimes very profound and sometimes more subtle that if we keep in the foreground it's very challenging for people unless they have a lot of uh, learned skill in coping with feelings and emotions it's very difficult for people to, to cope with them and so they they kind of disappear in the in the background but it turns out that there's a consequence you pay for that and, and the consequence seems to be the alert signal the pain signal as an alert. Um, in some yeah. ways, in some ways, for those of you who are, who are having pain or other physical symptoms and watching this podcast, in some ways, it's good that you're having a symptom once it's been ruled out as anything serious medically, because it provides you a kind of alert that you need to delve into the subject. You need to have a session with uh, Dan Ratner, or you need to see me in, in consultation or, or another doctor. So. I, that's what I'm trying to teach people about their symptom or their pain, that it pain is always real, but it, it, what the alert means is different when you break your leg versus when you have six months of unexplained knee pain, let's say, or six mm -hmm. months of unexplained back pain or three years of unexplained pain. So 
that's that's kind of my overall take briefly. And uh, you know, like the well, let's compare have. notes here. Yeah, let's compare notes here. Okay, so one of the ways that I feel, yeah, I have everybody. We all have ways that we kind of catalog how we differ with Sarno, or maybe how we differ with each other. Um, you and I have share share the bond of doubt being very important. And I've seen people cure their, their TMS through doubt work alone. Sometimes it's that powerful. So that's why I'm so fascinated to talk to you about it, that <clears throat> you and I see this similarly, that it can play a major role, not only in the type of people that come to it, uh, come to this kind of suffering, but also how to cure it. But another way that I find that I differ from, from some at least is a lot of people, um, stay pretty religiously close to what Sarno said about certain things. I think most of what he said was brilliant and I do factor it in and, and I, I don't really disagree with a ton of what he said, but I extend it. And one of the ways that I extend it is that I think that, I mean, he talks about, uh, mind body issues as a distraction from the emotions. I totally agree that that's part of what's going on, but I liked what you said about it because I think of it also as a communication. So the way that I think about it is in your early years, it was meant as that distraction. It was a survival technique, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like we buried it for a later discussion. And once we got to a place where we were comfortable enough as adults to function and maybe look at it again, the body comes knocking at your door. And it's saying, hey, you've got to look at this. Um, so that's one way that I differ. I don't even know if I differ, but that's the way that I think about it. Another thing that I bring to the work that I do um, is this term can be tricky for people, but I, I call it power. I think that TMS is, it's got multiple motivations as anything psychological does. And I think one of its motivations is to try to get you to, to now be powerful in the way that you didn't feel during those traumatic times. So the body, I describe it as the most empathic entity we have. It's saying, hey, you've really been through something and you can't, you can't continue to live this way. I'm going to force you to look at this. So it's this weird thing where it's a distraction and a communication at the same time. And I think what mind-body issues, that the function of it or, or how it functions is it likes to stay in the same place. It likes to be able to manage that distraction. It likes to be able to manage that communication all without you knowing and knowing at the same time. It's, it's a really complicated sounding thing. But when you think about it, it wants to stay in the same place. And I think it uses doubt to do that. What do you think about all that? That's, think, that's my spiel. I think those are great concepts, um, great ideas, and obviously you're you're probably fleshing them out for your book that you're working on as well. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we can say is that you know when someone, when science and medicine and psychology advance because people step on the shoulders, so to speak, of of those that originate originate something or, or develop a, a, a concept in the first place. So. I think at some level, although Dr. Sarno didn't love being disagreed with at times, that certainly he would appreciate the fact that there's another generation and maybe even another generation of doctors and psycho psychotherapists who are building upon his work. Even though there may be disagreements and modifications, it's really, as you said, adding to it. Uh, Dr. Sarno focused a lot on, on anger, and I think you alluded to the fact that you're, uh, you think other emotions are important, as do I, including fear, anxiety, grief, and um, as far as it coming out when you're, when you're comfortable or ready for it, sometimes it just comes out because it's, you're just overwhelmed at that point. So I'm not sure that I just totally can't take it anymore. Point. Yeah, because when I, I, when I track back people's symptoms getting worse in their 20s or 30s or 40s, there usually is some type of a stressor that came right before that or something that was difficult for them to cope with that perhaps reactivated the the kindling from the childhood or from teenage years or well, whatever. Let, yeah. Blew it let up. me clarify that though. Cause I, I, I don't mean to suggest everybody has a TMS flare up when they're ready to move forward. Precisely the opposite. Actually, mm. I think it happens when they're not ready to move forward, but there's a part of them that is. So it's about a conflict. So that's, you know, and, 
Go ahead. One. No, I just you you you. What's good is you can show a nuanced discussion because it's not just an either or. It's it's it has a you know combination of our. Per we're, we're more complex than just in one place or in another place. So that's good. No, no and not only that, it can it can be opposite things at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. So I just think that trauma gets buried and then we we get a chance to look at it later at some point. But typically these these things come up they're forced on us and it's usually because we're at the end of our rope with something just like you said um i don't i don't really think it's okay now i'm ready to to look at this i think it's oh my god this is unbearable i'm at the end of my rope i can't go on we're forced to look at it and i i, I don't i don't think it's necessarily the case that uh we ourselves are motivated to do it I think actually a lot of the time we do not want to do it. But I think that's part of, we can use that. You know, we can use what we know as part of the treatment. If if we're resisting what is actually a leap forward because it's scary or maybe we don't even want it, then we can use that to say, okay, well, wait a minute. Let's look at that conflict. This is true of a lot of mental health phenomena in general. There's nothing worse mm -hmm. than ha having a depression or being depressed. But depression often leads people to make a change in their life that they need to make. And if without that depression, yep. without feeling bad, a person wouldn't have the motivation to get up and do something different or start a new relationship or start a new job or whatever. That's what gives them the, the incentive because they feel so badly. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a case where it really is no pain, no gain. <laughs> um, now, that being said, I want to be deeply empathic to the people who are suffering. I did for eight years, and I, it felt like I was in, uh, you know, wandering around in the desert, not having any water for the whole time. So this is not like it's a good thing, but there are there is good that can come out of it if if you're surrounded by the right people or you have the right information. And I think that's the work you and I do is let's get them the right information so that. Even though there is the suffering, we can we can work on it. So I wanted to bring up one one way that I have shifted that's based on this. I'm totally curious to get your thoughts on that because you and I have never talked about this. It's something that I've developed more recently. Um, and it's essentially I've started doing a short-term consultation model. And this came out of the idea of Sarno's lectures, honestly, because... I, do you do lectures like Sarno does? Yeah, I did it. The, I did earlier on in my career, and then LA is not an easy place for people to get to uh, a certain location, a certain time in the pre-pandemic era. And so, yeah, I, no, you need forty-five it, minutes to get anywhere. I lived there for I, a while. Anywhere, anywhere. So I converted it into uh, recordings, which became, which were initially tapes, and then became CDs, and then became digitized, and so. I converted it into a home education program, but there is a benefit for sure of getting people together if that's possible. I'm looking at other ways to do it now through Zoom, and I've, I've done some webinars and some Q&As and that type of thing through Zoom. But um, yeah, yeah, well, well, that's that's part of what I'm looking at is, you know, the pandemic. It's one of those things where a crisis is also uh, in Chinese. I think the word crisis means opportunity. And mm -hmm. it really is the case that uh we have this opportunity with the pandemic to start working on these things. I always had plans to do something like Sarno and do seminars. So now we're going to start doing them. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've already started writing them up. I'm ready to go with them. And I think it's a big part of what people need. Part of it is also cost effectiveness. Yes. Yes. People, people can't afford to be seeing a therapist for, five to 10 years all the time on these things. And I also found I was seeing a therapist for, you know, speaking of things that people have been doing for decades, I was in therapy for decades and I was not getting all the gains that I needed to. And I found my, my mind body suffering got me more awareness and um, solutions and moves forward than therapy did and so i started thinking okay we gotta we gotta apply that it looked like you were gonna say something go ahead yeah i have a couple of a couple comments on that one is that many of the patients i've seen with what we call tms tension myoneural syndrome or chronic pain due to stress and tension many of them had been in therapy at one point or another in their lives sometimes uh, for for a lengthy period 
but it hadn't solved the problem. Once they were diagnosed with this condition and perhaps referred to a, spe uh, to a therapist who specialized in the condition like yourself, and I have a whole handful of people in Southern California do the work, et cetera, they began to make much more rapid progress because the goal of the therapy changed from understanding yourself better or something that's fairly amorphous to getting rid of the pain. So having that alert signal, having that symptom to try to resolve, and I'm not saying in all cases that resolving the symptom means that you're fixed permanently, but I tried to work with therapists that were comfortable with a six to 10 therapy session model, a shorter term model, which doesn't mean that everybody mm -hmm. was cured within six to 10 sessions, but it does mean that most people could get the pain relief that they needed by working with the therapist and myself with me providing kind of a guiding, educating, uh, supervising role and the therapist doing the in-depth uh, emotional work make a significant progress in a relatively shorter period of time because again, because of the cost factor for, for um, many people. I also like your idea of combining seminars and educational sessions, et cetera, because for this model to, to grow and, and, and become more of an, uh, uh, an effect on the society, we need, as you said, we need more cost-effective approaches, including group teaching, online teaching. You know, there's apps we can discuss, some of which are, have already been done uh, in this area. We need, we need these things to get it out to more people. I, I could not agree more. And I, I'm, it's evolving more and more where I'm realizing, because I do these short-term consultations and I spend maybe the first two sessions essentially doing a lecture. It's a personal lecture. But I, I've got all this information to give. If they could have a more cost-effective way of getting that information, then they could do a consultation with me, and it could be one or two sessions, and I could really zap things for them. And I think that's more and more where I'm moving towards. But considering I didn't have the modality before the pandemic to think through how I was going to do this, and I had uh, these these ideas about... Um, how to consult in the short term. I went about it that way first, where it's basically essentially two to four sessions. People can get a lot of information out of one session, but I usually encourage people, you got to come back at least a second time so I can tell you what does all this mean. And I and it started to evolve. And then I started doing this thing, which I call a TMS or mind-body map. And what it is, is <clears throat> you, have, you have four different columns. And I won't bore you with you know, all the details, but there's the emotions column, which is essentially, you know, what Sarno and we all work with figuring out the main themes. There's, and then there's the doubt column, which you and I would find very familiar. What are, what are all the things that are leading to doubt? Um, and I talk about three different levels of doubt. There's doubt, whether it's TMS, there's doubt that even if it is TMS, is TMS curable or helpable? And then there's, even if it is TMS and it's, and it's curable or helpable, can I do it? The doubts about the self. And so that, that, that flushes out the ideas of that column for the person. And then there's the power column, which is what it, where is the conflict of, of where are you living the life you want? The fourth column is action steps. And this is what people want. They're so hungry for it. They're like, how, how do I do it? So I just created a, a, a PDF of this. It's probably like 130 different types of ideas that you can do. And I just keep coming up with more things that I wish I had had and yeah, trying to I, make it more streamlined. Yeah. This is, this is great stuff that you're doing. I mean, it has elements of the, what's called cognitive behavioral therapy in the sense that it's educationally based, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. It also has element, you know, the, the condition, a big element as Sarno said to me years ago and it repeated in his lectures was that education was the penicillin for TMS, he said, which is not to imply that psychology it. is not important either. And also, getting back to the theme at the beginning of our discussion today, you pointed out that a doctor who does this work, a medical doctor, needs to be comfortable with psychology and listening to people's stories and narratives and emotional background. And similarly, a psychotherapist or a psychologist who does this work needs to be comfortable in a sense with instructing and advising and teaching in ways that many psychologists are not trained or, or interested in doing. And so you're talking mm -hmm. about how you're merging those two elements, just like I've had to merge those elements over the years to be effective at this work. So I think there's a lot to what you're saying. There's different ways that we can talk offline about different ideas we, to, to transmit this information, but 
Um, it's a process for patients. And, um, you know, I'm get, glad to talk about that more. But Yeah, I, 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 we will definitely do that. Because one of the things I have had to do, and this, this related to doubt, I needed to figure out what is going on physically. The one thing that Sarno said that I, I wouldn't say I disagree with it, but again, I've added a lot to it. And so have so many people is he said oxygen deprivation was the main cause um, of the the physical side of the psychosomatic issue. Because again, remember, psychosomatic means it starts in the head, but it becomes real in the body. Even that is something we need to make sure we talk about to make sure people can, can get these concepts and be open to them because it is real in the body. But I was like, oxygen deprivation, that, that makes sense as one possible thing, but it didn't strike me as making a whole lot of sense that that would explain everything. Ironically, I got the answer that worked for me through reading Candace Pert's book, Molecules of Emotion, which I got through Sarno. He mentions it, but it was kind of in passing. And of course, Howard Schubiner um, has done great work with this in terms of neural pathways, there's all kinds of different ideas that are contributing to this. But the idea uh, that PERT puts forward that peptides can go in your bloodstream and just send a message to any cell to do whatever really captured my imagination and, and made me feel like that's my understanding of it, that if the body can do it for physical reasons, it can be made to do it for psychosomatic reasons. That doesn't mean that is always the case. And of course, we always caution, go to see a doctor before you assume it is a mind-body issue. But typically, by the time people come to see me, they've seen many, many doctors. So I, don't, I generally don't need to, to worry about it. But, you know, one of the things that I, I wonder is, how do we change the national discussion on it? And I think what you were just talking about is crucial because doctors have to be able to talk some about psychology. And psychologists have to be able to talk some about the body because there really is... They really are one in a lot of ways. And to me, we've got to, we've got to build these connections. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm so thrilled to be connected with you. I mean, when I first read Sarno, I needed an MD telling me this stuff. I would not have taken it from just a psychologist. And this is coming from a psychologist. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm now at least a psychologist who is affiliated with all these doctors who, who medical doctors who agree, you, you included, that gives me huge comfort. And I think we've got to come together with both sides. That, that's part of how we're going to do it. But what do you think we need to do to change the national discussion? Oh, it's, a, it's a subject that I've been thinking about and, and working on on and off for, for, for years and years and years. So one thing that one project I'm working on is to try to get some of this educational material into the curriculum of middle school, high schools. And I've been working on a curriculum. Oh, that's amazing in a mind-body workbook for teenagers, uh, which uh, is a, mind, a, mi a miniature version of the mind-body workbook that I wrote that people use for um, expressive journaling. And the, the idea is if you could expose people to this at a younger age, that when they do have physical symptoms that are due to stress and tension in their 20s and 30s, that the concept will be familiar to them. Maybe they'll even push the subject forward if their doctor doesn't mention it. They'll say, you know, I learned about this in high school. You know, why don't you know about... Uh, so right, that's one right. thing is, is to get it, get it into the educational systems. The challenge of getting into medical schools, uh, you know, they're very entrenched in their thinking. But on the other hand, you know, nutrition was out of medical schools until a certain number of years ago, and it's gotten much more into medical schools. So we've just got to keep pushing, uh, you know, people who are doing research in our field, uh, including Dr. Schubiner and, and others, that helps quite a bit because... Dr. Sarno built a beautiful house, but never built the foundation, which was the, the scientific research that was needed to help uh, support the work that he conceptualized in his, in his mind initially, and then wrote about so eloquently. And so uh, we have an on, and sp just speaking, you're speaking at conferences, my speaking at conferences, you know, I spoke at one a few months before the pandemic started, it was extremely well received by uh, medical doctors, psych psychologists and nurses uh, on the West Coast. So getting out and speaking, um, educating people, taking interns into your office, if, if that's something that's feasible, all of these will spread the word. It's just, um, and then it would, wouldn't hurt to have a celebrity or two more. There were a couple in that movie, but wouldn't hurt to have a couple celebrities. Like 
I was reading recently, a lot of diseases became a lot more well known once a celebrity was associated with that disease. It's terrible to think that our society is dependent upon celebrities, but um, that seems to have happened <clears throat> in a number of conditions. And uh, I, I can think back to Katie Couric's husband dying of colon cancer. I can think back to Ronald Reagan actually having colon cancer during his presidency quite a long time ago. But these things mm -hmm. increase. It, cha the, it uh, changes the picture. It really yeah, does. Screening for colon cancer. So we need. I, I've treated celebrities, as of many of the many of the doctors in this group, uh, but uh, not all of them are willing to come forward with something that has this tint of a mental condition. Again, it's biopsychosocial. It's mind body it doesn't yeah. mean it's wrong with you mentally but it's it has that tint of what is it all about stress you know you're not coping well and so it's a little harder to get somebody to step forward for this condition but i'm always optimistic we'll find somebody who's the right person to do that and um, i think we will and actually i i think there's some of them out there yeah that we gotta we gotta link them up like lady gaga talks about these kinds of things I would love to talk to her about these things to compare notes because she she's totally on to this. What what I think you and I bring to the table, though, is what to do about it, you know. Yeah. So we can have I think it's great that the national discussion is kind of starting to catch on that this is a real thing. I don't think most people know what to do about it. And I think there's just so few of us that really understand this that I, I agree with you. I think we have to be very vocal we have to get out there. I mean, look, this is the reason I'm doing the podcast more than anything is I want to change the national discussion on it. I did. I wanted to throw out one other idea. First of all, I should say I loved a lot of your ideas, but I think um, the idea of catching people while they're young and getting it into the education system is huge. And I hadn't thought of it. I mean, I wanted to change the, 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 di you know, the discussion so that parents know about this and schools know about it. But I really do think there is something about the young people are, are open to it. And I thought about this with my own daughter. I was like, am I going to teach my daughter about these things when she's going to believe something so different than everybody else? And I decided, absolutely. I've got to teach her what is real and what can be helpful to her. And she she kind of cracks up. She has conversations with kids that, uh, <laughs> this is funny, but you know, we're Jewish and she, she definitely ruined some Santa Claus stories for some kids. Not, not, I did not encourage her to, but she just, she was like, it doesn't make sense. I mean, she, it was like hernia disc cause back pain and Santa Claus exists. No, none, none of this is actually true. And, um, you know, she will tell people about this and she's not shy about it. And so I think getting the young people on board is great. And maybe you and I can find a way to collaborate on how do we get this to, um, to the education system, to the schools. I, I think it's a great idea. But I also think um, money is a big shifting force. And I think we have that on our side in a way also, because the healthcare system is absolutely crippled by these issues. And if we can bring this to the right people, and maybe it is through a celebrity who, who understands this, we can we can take it to the national discussion and make it something that really we can show people this affects you this even if you're not a pain sufferer it affects you the, th the thing is that we have an effective system for treating these disorders and and that many doctors and even some psychologists are not optimistic that even if they say to a patient you know i think this is due to your stress they don't really know what to do with that and we have exactly and we have educational materials and we have journaling and we have other systems in place that they can use to help people, but they don't understand. They don't know that yet. They're just not familiar enough with it. I agree. I think, I think in a way we're, we're as a nation on this, we're, we've made progress and we're having some of the right discussions, but we're kind of stuck in neutral because I have a lot of uh, friends in the medical field and they're totally on board with the fact that stress causes these things, but they have no tools to offer. And I think that's where you and I come in. So, David, I want to thank you for coming on. You, you, you were a wonderful guest. I hope you'll come on again. I, I imagine we're going to uh, collaborate on a bunch of different things because you, like me, really want to move things forward. And it's people like you that, that are really going to help with the national discussion, have been doing it for years. But the more we get you out there and me out there, the better because... We've got to have these dialogues. I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, it's David Schechter, Dr. David Schechter. He's in L.A. 
Uh, he, he's a, a, a wonderful person and a, a great clinician and a great example of somebody who listens to the data and understands the importance of that. And uh, I'm proud to know him. Thank you for coming on, David. Thanks for having me, Dan. I appreciate it. Okay, talk to you soon. Dan, that was great. That he, What a great interview. I, I would love to talk to him myself. I have lots of questions. Thank you. Yeah, he's he's a fascinating guy. Um, and he has all kinds of fascinating information. There's a lot of people in this field. And when I talk to them, uh, we're, we're uh, hoping to have Howard Schubiner on. He's another doctor uh, in the Detroit area. And we're hoping to have him on too. And he has all of this research. Uh, he's the leading guy in terms of research stuff. But there's something about David Schechter that, that is very helpful to me. And it, it goes along with what we talked about earlier in mm-hmm. the podcast about all these doctors, there's not that many of them actually, but, but the, so I said all of these doctors, but there's, there's really only a few that I yeah. know. I, I, and I get so excited when an MD, you know, has, wants to talk about this because, you know, it's something that we were talking about earlier that it, you know, it really solidifies this feeling of truth to what we're feeling, to have it validated by by a doctor. I mean, I, you know, I, I wish that we could just feel what we feel and know that, you know, it's normal, it's okay, um, or I'm gonna give it some time. But I find personally that having that validation from the medical community can solidify exactly what it is so that I can move on. Right. Yeah. Well, and and in the people that I work with, I require that they have been to see a doctor, but that's usually like a prerequisite that's long gone. People have seen so many doctors by the time they come to see me. Yeah. But it's really nice to have doctors like uh, David Schechter or Howard Schubiner or John Strax in in Chicago, who we're also going to have on. These are people that if somebody needs to be evaluated, I can send them to a mind body knowledgeable person and more they're more than mind body body knowledgeable they're knowledgeable in the way that i am they they have i mean we all bring our own special expertise areas Mm -hmm. and but it's really nice to have that that aspect where you can send them to a doctor to find out one of the reasons that i particularly um love being connected with with david though is the doubt connection as you heard in the interview It's which, you know, John Strax uh, believes in that. I'm going to talk to Howard Schubiner, find out what he he thinks about it. It's hard. I think when when you are on this path to healing and there's a little bit of trust that that your body's responding to it. But then, like he said, you you maybe come to a point, maybe another stress happens in your life and you're feeling exacerbation of the same thing. But oh, haven't yeah. Come to that realization yet. Right. So, you know, to come back and say, I don't know, you know, is is this really what what I'm feeling. I mean, it's, it is a lot of just doubt in, in that. I always feel like, can it be that easy? Yeah. Do you ever feel like, like it should be harder than that? Is it, can that possibly, that's like magic. No, no, no. (laughs) Even, even more than that. I I sometimes felt in my own recovery that it was too good to be true. And as a Mm -hmm. result, I I mean, you said it could be too easy, but I, I mean, like my top wish would be that this is something I can get control of Mm -hmm. that I can make go away. And even more so, it went beyond my wildest dreams. It it actually helped me become a more powerful, confident, happy person. It was like, yeah, because it gives you control over your, you feel like you have a little bit of control over your life. And I think what happens for a lot of people is they start to feel this unraveling of, you know, of a lack of control, a lack of power over changing their situation or their circumstance. Right. And, you know, yeah. I think, I think too, with doubt, you start to, to think, okay, well, if it is this easy and you were to tell someone like, oh my, I mean, we've heard from people that, you, you know, they listened or read your PDF or whatever it was. And all of a sudden it, 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 it's cured or it's gone. Right. And I think like there's, evaporated. even when you hear yourself say that, it almost sounds like really, uh, right? it, well, it, so- it but, sounds magical. And that I don't, I don't trust magic. So that, that freaks me out. And it, you know, it made, it made me have to really think about my message. How do I convey this to people? Because I don't want to come off being like, yeah, I'm a wizard. And I, uh, 
I mean, it, but it I makes me sound like I, I played think, Dungeons and Dragons. I think <laughs> when they go when they go back to ask that question the second time, or if they're coming to you and saying, you know, um, could it could it really be a mind body connection? Do you feel like there are certain? I, I'm just curious: is there a divide between people that seem to be very connected to themselves with a body awareness to those that? don't seem to have a connection, you know, with, with their breath, with their body. Cause I, well, I always feel like, I always feel like I'm hypersensitive to sensation, to knowing my body, how I breathe, blah, blah, blah. Cause that's just, that's what I've been doing for so long. But I think a lot of people don't have that connection and that may make, I'm just curious from your experience, does that make the doubt um, you do see that more coming from people that are less connected um, to their to them. Well, I love I love your question, but but I think the best way I can answer it that will do the most service to the most people is to say that doubt comes in thousands of forms. Sure. So you're talking about one form of doubt. It's a very important form of doubt. I I definitely I, I want you to know. Like I I think that's a very important form of doubt, way up at the top. But doubt comes in all kinds of forms, uh, um, and it's incredibly insidious. So mm-hmm. doubt, doubt creeps in without people even knowing it. Mm-hmm. They think they're walking around with certainty, but they're having a symptom. And they come to me and they say, why am I having this symptom? Mm-hmm. And we start talking about it. And usually what comes up, look, it could be that they're having some kind of emotional experience that channels into a symptom. But But for the people who have cured one symptom... That's not so typical. They don't usually come back to me with that. One of the reasons I talk about doubt so much is that's the insidious one. That's the one that comes back all the time. Mind-body issues, as I've seen them, I know you have a totally different take on it that I'll get to know over time as we talk about this, but mind-body issues are always looking for a way to creep back in. And the easiest way it can creep back in is just a tiny little doubt. The tiniest sliver of a doubt. Maybe you were shoveling your stairs. Yes. Yes. Or the doctor said something, said you're fine, but they said it with some hesitation. That's enough doubt for anybody. Absolutely. Or at least for some people. So there is, there's a way to distinguish between people who are in touch with their body or not. But Mm -hmm. there's also the parameter of people who have a lot of doubt or not, Mm -hmm. or people who are in touch with their emotions or not, Mm -hmm. or people who um, can tolerate their anger or not. So actually, when I do an assessment, I am basically assessing, where's the doubt? That's a huge part of what I'm thinking about. I like to think about what's happening for them emotionally. I need to get a sense of that. So before people meet with me in these consultations, they fill out some questions in advance, which allow me to explore the symptom instead of who they are. I have some map of who they are by the time they show up. Then when they come in, I help them hone those emotional themes down to their essence. Hmm. But one of the reasons I'm doing it is I've got to get at their doubt. I've got to get at what's what's the actual meaning for the person. So, you know, it's interesting. When, when you're saying if a person comes in and they're out of touch with their body, there are people who are out of touch with their body and know it. There are people who are out of touch with their body and have no idea. Hmm. There are people who have been super in touch with their body their whole lives and suddenly aren't. There are people who have also, never been in touch with their body. Yeah, go ahead. Could, could that also play into the same way you would think about power? Like, I mean, is there a difference between someone that presents themselves pow- as oh, you know, a powerful person, but is full of doubt, or someone that just it lives within a framework of feeling confident? I mean, I call, the, I call it confidence. You call it power. Are, you know, are... The, in a way, I feel that those are, are the same. Oh, absolutely. The terms doubt and power are the ones that I chose for me. And so I tell people this all the time. We need to find the words that work for them. So mm-hmm. doubt could be confusion. It could be questioning, just not sure, or a lack of certainty. It could be fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be not wanting to believe in the self or disbelief that you would know. And power is the same way. I, I, I work with somebody who she needed to change the word to strength. I think I mentioned this actually yeah, on, yeah. on 
the last episode, I think. It's hard to even remember mm-hmm. anymore. I, I I doubt whether it was. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, because confidence and strength are two would be two of the words I give you for what yeah. I what I. Yep. But, but I think. I think there's a, a little a, a bit of that word power that um, as a woman, I feel isn't as easy to, and maybe it's just me, but to um, identify with right away that, yes, I mean, I think in our world right now, we're starting to step into that power. And I love that because I have felt mm-hmm. it myself. Um, I felt that, you know, that there's a support around that. But maybe that is something that I would realize with with you that we that what is that? Maybe there is a subtle different in you know difference. There, there, there. is, yeah. I mean, I I let people go where they need to go with that to build whatever they need to build. Maybe they need confidence first. Maybe they need strength first. Maybe they never want to approach power, and that's okay. And but, I think though, what power will do when when we're talking about could this really be working for me? Is this something that, you know, coming back to what Dr. Schechter was talking about with the the repeat visitor, right? Like the one that's doubting yep. is, you know, if I feel um, that I have that, that power, confidence, strength to um, heal myself, because one of the things I really believe in is the body is always working for us. It, the body's main thing before anything else is to stay alive, right? Mm-hmm. So the body is trying to stay alive. So if we learn to connect- I'm sorry, that, you you just made me think of, who does number two work for? <laughs> That's the Austin Powers quote. I'm sorry, I had to say it. Okay, got it. A little but, humor injected there. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but- I really, I, I, that's kind of. I, I got you totally I, off track, didn't I? Yes, I did. Go ahead. <laughs> but but don't you think that that there's there's this, if I can have control over my body and trust that it's trying to save me in the worst case scenarios, and, um, and then yes. I can say yes, you know what this this is what we talked about. This is a language. This is um, it's it's a piece of information or a piece of even. Uh, um, verbiage that we can use that will lead us into a simple idea shift in our mind. You know what's really interesting? I, I just had this thought as you were talking, and it's that, I mean, our bodies are so important. Our bodies are so important to us, and we are so important to our bodies. There's actually a really great bond that you have with your body. And I know that there's a lot of people listening who are in pain, and they're certainly not going to feel that way. I used to feel that my body was my enemy, Mm -hmm. or at least my back. And I would be so angry that it was hurting. I would actually hit my own back uh, because I was so frustrated. Wow. Wait, hold on. I I, I don't want to lose this. Hold that thought. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, the idea I was thinking of is that when you – Our elemental love for ourselves that comes from childhood starts in our bodies. And so when you get hurt and you cry, which, you know, generally, especially as a boy, you're taught not to, at least in my generation and generations before that. But I think the reason that people cry when they hurt themselves is partly because they are upset that their body was hurt. They actually love their body. It's, It's them. Anyways, I had to say that. What were you, you going to say? Yeah, well, this goes right along with that. Is that when working with people, we um, through an Ayurvedic practice, such a big part of that is um, you'll hear these different techniques like dry brushing, self oil massage. Um, you know, where you actually are encouraged to place your hand on yourself as an act of self love. That alone, I have seen change people like in it and heal them in unbelievable ways. It's the one practice, a daily practice and ritual that people really, really enjoy. Because when you do that, you know, what do you do when you have a baby that's skin to skin? You're putting, Mm -hmm. you know, this, this um, love, right onto and and when you do it to yourself, you know, I I don't know if it's a cultural thing or what, but we're just like, don't touch, you know, so we're not even touching ourselves, which I think, Mm -hmm you know, is a powerful, powerful thing. And, and to go back to what you were talking about with kids. So 
you know, when I when when Dr. Schechter was talking about bringing mindfulness into or um, talking about mind body work with kids, how how incredible that is because I've seen it with not only my own kids but I've seen three and four year olds. You know, they they're closer to nature than we are, and when you're a kid, you'll that's just because they're shorter. Yeah, I'm yeah. Kidding. Well, that's true. That too. But <laughs> but they they have this innate and intuitive sense that you know that whatever they're feeling is what they're feeling. There's no doubt there. Right. And and right. This is, and that's this true the with the body. If everything is real to them, and and as they grow. Look at a three-year-old because I've worked with three-year-olds, right? That are that are absorbing everything, and you go to a sixth grader, right? And they're already they're you know you go to kindergarten and they're already doubting what they would never have. Oh doubted yeah, at this three or that's four years such a great old. point. That's such a great point. So I I remember one time uh, one of my nephews was at I think it was one of my birthday parties or something, and he was there, and he had gone off into the other room by himself. He was four at the time. And I came in to, to see what was going on with him. Shout out to you, G. Um, <laughs> and you too, Verge. Okay. And, but G, uh, my younger nephew of my brother and sister-in-law, he had gone in the other room and I said, um, what's, what's going on? And he was like, well, I just wasn't feeling very good. I didn't like what they were talking about in there. And I, I loved that he had he had no doubt about that. You know, we yeah. we it's almost like and I think this is along the lines of what you were saying, we teach we teach people to not trust their intuition. We teach people yeah. Talk to about eating. have doubt. Think and about then it. and then how do we expect people to get better? We we tell them, Okay, it's this. We've taught them for decades to doubt and doubt and doubt and doubt. Well ask it ask a kid, you know, a kid is not going to eat if they're not hungry. They just won't. They're not they're not going to go to mm-hmm. bed when they're not tired. But if they are tired, they're going to go to bed, right? Mm-hmm. And when we eat, what I try to teach people is, you know, oh my gosh, this said to eat six small meals a day and this says to only eat meat and this says to only, never eat meat. And it's so confusing to people. But in actuality, the best thing for us circadian wise is to eat a huge lunch a meal at lunch and if you're gonna miss a meal dinner would be the one to miss but it's tradition to eat supper to eat dinner mm-hmm. it is tradition it is not you know it's a great tradition <laughs> but it is a tradition we eat according to circadian rhythm and if you well, do we- that you know? We have to do a whole episode on tradition. We got to remember this. Write that down at some point. Okay, I'll write it down. You can, you can even do it right now. <laughs> yeah, because look, one of the traditions that we have, and I, I really, I want to I wanna really think about this uh, with, with you and, and with the viewing audience. We have traditions that aren't working mm-hmm. and, and, we, and we just keep doing them. Yeah. So I'm going to say something deep, that could upset a lot of people. They're deep-seated traditions too. Yeah, well, there, there are things like one of the traditions we have is you're not powerful. You're not special. That is a tradition that we're actually carrying forward. So one of the things I love in my work is not only working with doubt, but one of the other ways that I differ from, not that I differ from the other people in the mind-body world, but I emphasize this more or, or at least have seen it as a bigger factor in understanding what's going on for people is helping people be powerful. So I'm breaking down traditions that I don't, I don't think are good. Now, here, here's one thing I'll say that it could upset a lot of people, but I'm going to say it anyway, um, <laughs> because it's for the kids. Anything for the kids. So Halloween is also a tradition, and we're, we're you know, it's the fall as we're filming this, and uh, Halloween is a tradition that seems like it's a lot of fun, and it is for some, but it's also really scary for a lot of kids. So when we were living in Brooklyn, my kids, my daughters would walk around and they were terrified and it just keeps ramping up. And I think there's a lot of traditions that are very adult centric. And if we're going to have traditions, I'd want them to be kid centric. I want them. I want to get back to the wisdom that kids do carry. They don't have tons of doubt. They walk in a room, they say what they think. 
if you're looking for support, look to your kids or look at the kids in your life because you know they're going to be the most honest. You also know that they they just carry, I, I, I just keep going back to this, they're closer to nature than we are. They have, Did, they really do have this innate sense of what their needs are. It, it comes, it comes with birth. It comes with you. So that is a gift. And I think when, when we're sharing that and letting the child know or the grown up know that through a physician or um, a psychologist or any whoever can support that person in just saying and trusting that what you're saying is coming from you, there's truth to it. Let's figure it out. Maybe it's tangled up. And that's exactly what I feel like you're doing is we've got these tangled up truths. We've got all these other things mixed in. Can we weave out can we can we get rid of, uh, you know, what we say is the stories that aren't true anymore? Right. That. Yeah. That that don't maybe they did apply. They applied when we were a teenager or a young adult, but they don't apply anymore. And then that kind of flips a switch with people and they go, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't have to live this way. Right. 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 It's life. changing. I mean, mean, those things are like it can take it can take any form. I mean, it's even with like sports fans. I I thought I have to be a certain way. Like I. I, there was a time where I would have been wed to the idea that I could not root for LeBron James as a Laker. I didn't feel that way at all. And look, uh, a lot of that is because he won a championship in Cleveland, and I'm uh, that's fantastic, and my life is uh, partially complete now. So thank you, LeBron, if you're watching. <laughs> but I was rooting for him all the way. I, I love the guy. and I wanted him to have success. I never thought I would root for the Lakers. And that was just... It, there's a freedom that can come and mm-hmm. there's so much freedom that comes through working working with your body with understanding what it is saying to trust and that's actually a, it's another topic though that i want us to talk about so I, I i'm sorry i feel like i'm asking you to be a secretary at the moment my apologies <laughs> but we should do we should do some episodes on how to talk with your kids in a way that doesn't rob them of their power because mm-hmm. you know that's my, pretty easy. My, One answer: validate what they're saying. Done. For okay, sure. Moving for on sure. To but the you. Next. <laughs> but but there's there. All right, we're done. We don't need to do that episode. Julie covered it. But actually, listen. There, there's there's more to it, Julie. Yeah. I have some things to say. Um, you know, yes, we do have to validate them. But the thing is, there's a tradition of not validating. There's a tradition of, you know, if if an adult comes over and wants to hug your kid, there's a there's a, a yes. tradition of. You have to let the up. adult have what they want. Yeah. Why are we doing that? That's crazy. I think um, that's changing. I think it is changing. And I, I, you know what? I'm very proud of our generation. I think Gen X is doing it. We, we don't get a whole lot of credit for all, all kinds of things, but I think we're pretty great. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I didn't expect to end on a Gen X note, but uh, there you go. <laughs> we had great music and we're awesome. And t- take that, everybody. We're going to be powerful. You can't stop Woo. us. I don't care what the tradition is. So this was a great episode. It was so great to have David Schechter on. Thank you for coming on, David. I hope you come on again soon. Keep doing what you're doing. Yes, keep doing what you're doing. champion Um, for it. And a champion for for doubters too because people are going to come back and and ask. They need to be reassured. And that's one thing I want to put in a plug for. A lot of people say they read Sarno's books or other books and there's all these miraculous cures. But... Even the people who get cured have cured in quotes have da- I did a one sided quote. What is that? I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> those people, they're going to have doubts creep in. I have doubts creep in sometime. You need to know how insidious it is. And so, you know, having David checked around is special in that way. So I'm glad we had him. Uh, thank you all for listening and watching. And we will see you next time. Every week, Crushing Doubt will bring you new guests and important insights and tips on mind-body experience. We want you to be a part of our effort to change the national dialogue on pain and other symptoms. So please click subscribe, hit like, and ring the bell for notifications on YouTube. Sign up for our newsletter on crushingdoubt.org for updates on my upcoming book's release date, information on new episodes, and the chance to sign up for my live seminars coming this fall on all of the strategies for breakthroughs with pain and other symptoms.
You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Crushing Doubt. If you have any questions you would like answered on the show, please email info at crushingdoubt.org or tag us on all social media platforms at Crushing Doubt. The more support we get, the more influence we can have in changing the national discussion on pain and symptoms to a more accurate and helpful one. If you like what you hear, please consider a donation to our podcast, which requires expenses for equipment, editing, and expanding our reach. You can support us by making a donation to at Crushing Doubt on Venmo. Thank you to our growing podcast audience. I know there are so many out there suffering, sometimes in silence, and I am hoping to reach and help each and every one of you to resolve your doubts, find relief, and perhaps most importantly, find powerful, peaceful, and happy living. <laughs>